Today I'll be discussing Eugen Sandow. Sandow was a 19th century Victorian bodybuilder, arguably the first ever modern celebrity bodybuilder, who I think is best known for his impressive muscular development that he achieved in an era before anabolic androgenic steroids existed. Just think of what the bodybuilders of Sandow's era could have achieved with modern training and nutrition protocols, much less pharmaceutical enhancement. I mean, they didn't have squat racks, and until George Hackenschmidt, they didn't even bench press, and yet despite that, they achieved impressive muscular physiques. I think the bodybuilders of Sandow's era serve as role models for what we can achieve without the use of any exogenous hormones. Among the many harms that the advent of pharmaceutical enhancement in bodybuilding has brought about is that it's made a lot of natural lifters feel disillusioned about what they can realistically achieve. And I think the source of this disillusionment comes from the phenomenon of the fake natural. That is, those who take exogenous hormones and then lie through their teeth that they're drug-free. When you get deeper into lifting, you realize that this phenomenon of the fake natural is actually pretty common, ranging all the way from A-list Hollywood actors to social media celebrities to recreational lifters just trying to impress people at the club. For anyone with a modicum of integrity, it's sickening stuff that this goes on. So when people starting out with lifting find out about this, they often get a bit disheartened because they believe that their dream physiques can only be achieved by waving a magical chemical wand. But bodybuilders like Sandow and his ilk serve to illustrate that the ceiling for natural gains is actually pretty high. And I think in many cases, for people considering using gear, if they could somehow look through a magic lens and see where they'd end up after a decade, let's say, of consistent efforts in natural bodybuilding, not even doing it 100% right, even just, say, 80-90% to 90 right, then they wouldn't want to feel the needle's kiss. And while such a magic lens doesn't exist, we do have bodybuilders like Sandow as our next best thing. And for that reason, they're a very valuable and inspiring historical record for natural lifters today. Because they communicate, yes, you can actually look pretty damn impressive without gear. However, the fact that steroids, or the phenomenon of the fake natural, didn't exist in Sandow's era, doesn't mean that the bodybuilders were honest by default. In fact, it's more the contrary. In this video, I'd like to present the unfortunate case that the bodybuilding slash fitness industry, whatever you want to call it, has been bogged in horse crap from day one. That's right. Since bodybuilding's very inception, since ground zero, bodybuilders have been trying to bamboozle, mystify, and lie to the general public for monetary profit or ego satisfaction. To support this claim, I'm going to review a book written by Sandow named Strength and How to Obtain It, originally published in 1897. Sandow's book is composed of two sections. In the first section, Sandow describes his system of physical culture, so that's basically the section where he describes how to get stronger and more muscular. And in the second section, Sandow describes exciting tales from his personal life. I'll review both of these sections, starting with section 2. Sandow lies so excessively and so obviously in section 2 of his book that I'm surprised that nobody before me has felt a need to point out his shameless hogwash. In fact, every source I looked at online seemed to accept his claims uncritically, and even some academic papers I read took his manifest fabrications at face, while others glossed over the tall stories as if some kind of merely stylistic hyperbole, an idiosyncrasy, perhaps, of fireside yarns of the Victorian age. In this part of my video, I'd like to correct those misconceptions about Sandow, and reveal that not only was he a compulsive liar, 
he also displayed some of the nastier traits of his time. Now I know I've made some bold claims here, so let's kick things off with a really obvious lie. On page 157, Sandow tells us what his measurements are, so waist, neck, calf, etc. I'd like to draw your attention to his claim that his forearms measured 17 inches in circumference at a height of 5 foot 9. This is an insane measurement, and no, in case you're wondering, we can't chalk this insane measurement up to Sandow simply measuring differently to the way that we do today because on page 28 he outlines how he measures his forearms and it's no different to the way that we do it today. In case you have no conception of how truly insane a 17 inch forearm circumference measurement is at a height of 5 foot 9, allow me to introduce you to my good friend and seven time Mr. Olympia winner Phil Heath. Hey, Solomon Nelson. Hey, like, Phil, what's up? Know, we're training at 3 o'clock today. So what do we got? Is that pizza pizza? So that, yeah, that's, what, 16 and a half? So I don't know. You want to do the arm? <laughs> so that's what... You're not even that's, flexing. So that is oh my almost 19 and a half now. Oh. <laughs> All right. So Phil Heath's forearms measure 16.5 inches. So consider this. Phil is roughly the same height as Sandow. He is openly pharmaceutically enhanced, and he's considered one of, if not the most genetically gifted bodybuilders of all time. I mean, his nickname was literally the gift, for heaven's sake. And Sandow is claiming that his forearms have a greater measurement than Phil's. I call that horse crap. But why doesn't anyone else? It seems even the BBC believes in Sandow's measurements. See, look, here on the BBC website, we've got this article, Ergen Sandow, the man with the perfect body. And here they say his biceps were an impressive 19.5 inches blah 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 okay as well as his measurements sandow also fabricates his feats of strength for instance sandow claims in chapter 9 that he fought a lion in one-on-one -on -one combat in san francisco and he makes it clear that this was no garden variety cub but rather a particularly furious lion who made a meal of his keeper a week before Sandow met it. Further, Sandow mentions that it was the largest and finest lion of the many he had encountered, weighing in at 530 pounds or 240 kilos. Of course, Sandow defeated the lion, but it was the manner in which he defeated the lion that is most striking. You see, Sandow fought this lion twice, the first time was in a practice session, a rehearsal, if you like. And the second time was before the public in a pay-to-view event. He won both times, but in different ways. The first time we can call a physical victory. Sandow simply overpowered the lion. The lion lunged at him, but he stepped to the side, and before the lion had a chance to recover, he caught the lion around the throat with his left arm and round the middle with his right, and by this means, though the lion's weight was a staggering 530 pounds, he lifted the lion as high as his shoulder and gave the lion a good hug to assure the lion that it was necessary to respect him and then tossed the lion onto the floor. So, Sandow, with bare hands, can lift an irregular 240 kilogram, living, breathing, murderous weight to his shoulder and then throw it. Well, if the first fight was a physical victory, then I'd describe the second fight as a spiritual one. You see, upon making eye contact with Sandow in the arena, the lion was so terrified that it cowered and refused to fight him again. Sandow could only spur on the lion's aggression by twisting its tail, which was the only thing that made the lion lunge at him. 
Sandow then dodged, swung around, and picked the lion up, and then tossed him down. The lion, recognising that Sandow's strength was too great, refused to fight after that. Sandow then picked up the cowardly lion and marched around the arena with the lion on his shoulders, with the lion remaining as firm as a rock and as quiet as a lamb all the while. Now it's with the benefit of modern competitive strength sports that we can see just how ridiculous these claims are. To get a 240 kilo lion on his shoulders, Sando would have had to have done some manner of a clean and press or clean and jerk. Consider that Sandow claims that he weighed 14 stone and 6 pounds, or 91.6 kilos, in his My Measurement section. For the time being, though I have my doubts, let's just assume that this was the truth. Now consider that the world record clean and jerk in the 96 kilo weight class, today, is 231 kilos, held by Tian Tao. <laughs> Consider further that this was performed with an Olympic barbell, an instrument that's designed to be lifted, and not a lion. Unlike a barbell, a lion doesn't have a convenient handle, so I think it would be incomparably harder to pick up a lion compared to a barbell of equivalent weight. If we were to take Sandow at his word, which we shouldn't, then he would have been able to break Tian Tao's world record clean and jerk easily. I don't think this is credible in the least, and I strongly suspect that aspects of this alleged lion fight have been exaggerated. Worse yet is a feat of strength he describes in Chapter 3 that's so utterly extraordinary that I don't think anyone could believe it. Sandow begins the chapter by describing a gigantic quarryman he spotted in the street, and, well, there's really no way to do this chapter any justice unless I just read it out. I met a veritable giant. So huge and extraordinary was his appearance that my horse positively shied at him. His head as huge and grotesque as that of any pantomime mask, with a nose the size of an ordinary fist. As for his own fist, it would have made more than three of mine, and when a five-shilling piece was placed beneath the ball of his finger, believe me, it was impossible to see it. So large were his boots that not only could I get both feet into one, but I could turn entirely round inside. And yet, strangely enough, despite his immense limbs and body, he was not a particularly tall man. A little more than six foot two and a half inches, in fact, was his height. His chest measurement was about 80 inches, and his weight 400 pounds. He was not a fat man in proportion to his size. Quite the contrary, he was bony and muscular. We wrestled together, and it was his business to make himself the victor. In order to finish me, he took a cannon, weighing 400 pounds, and placed it in his broad shoulders, prepared to fire. I at once climbed to the top, and, getting into a position above my antagonist, I lifted him, his refuge, and his cannon, with one finger, a few inches off the ground. During this part of the performance, we fired the cannon, and the whole display was brought to a conclusion by placing my arm through a leathern belt, which girt his waist, and carrying him at arm's length off the stage. First, the proportions of this gigantic man that Sandow described were most likely exaggerated. Allegedly, this gigantic man was about as tall and heavy as 2017 World's Strongest Man, Eddie Hall, in his competitive prime. I don't think it's conceivable that someone could weigh this much at this height, while at the same time being bony and muscular, considering that, well, I'll flip in a picture of him, this is how Eddie Hall looked at 400 pounds, and Eddie is a pharmaceutically enhanced genetic freak. He's anything but bony. 
Second, I highly doubt that Sandow lifted a weight in excess of 363 kilos a few inches off the ground with only one finger. Though this isn't a highly contested competition lift, as far as I could find, the world record one-finger deadlift is 129.5 kilos. Although I'm sure many strongmen could break this record if they cared to, I doubt that they'd be able to break it by well over 200 kilos, like Sandow claimed he was able to do. 800 pounds are a lot of weight. Even the great Ronnie Coleman struggled to deadlift 800 pounds for a double, and that was with the help of both hands, all fingers on the bar, lifting straps, and a weightlifting belt. As for Sandow's claim that during this part of the performance, they fired the cannon, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret it. Did he mean to say that it was while he was holding the 800 plus pounds, cannon included with one finger, that they fired the cannon? If so, then Sandow is doubly strong, not only because he can lift in excess of 800 pounds with one finger, but also because he can do it with a very unstable, wobbly, and literally explosive item in his grip. There are other examples of Sandow's feats of strength in this book, like his alleged 300 pounds one-arm overhead dumbbell press that can be easily disproved by comparing them to current world records. And I could keep going on in this fashion, but frankly, there are more interesting lies to discuss. You see, Sandow's lies extend beyond just exaggerating what he can lift and how big his forearms are, and into the realm of the surreal. A perfect example of this surreality belongs to chapter 11, which is titled, My Dog Sultan, End of the Tour. That's right, Sandow wrote, more or less, an entire chapter about his dog, Sultan. Sandow claims that he was given his dog, Sultan, by a prince. Sultan was the holder of 17 first prizes. Whatever those prizes were for is unmentioned. But perhaps Sandow gave those first prizes to Sultan himself, in the same way that Ugandan dictator Idi Amin Dada gave his own kid a Medal of Valor. Idi Amin Dada, BC, DSO, MC, CBE will now present the nation's highest award, the Medal of Valor, to his son, Mwanga Amin. I give this prestigious honor to my six-year-old boy for having worked so untiringly with me during the numerous crises under which most normal men would have cracked. <laughs> Sultan weighed an impressive 200 pounds, or 90.7 kilos, and he had a remarkable intelligence, as indicated by, one, his disdain for the assistance of the niggers in transporting Sandow's luggage, Yes, the dog can transport Sandow's luggage. And two, how the dog would never leave the house unless he knew he had his satchel containing his chain, a muzzle, a box of pills, two brushes, a toothbrush, a comb, and some flannel, and was acutely aware whenever each of these contents was missing. Did I also mention that the dog could pick up Sandow and carry him up a flight of stairs? That's on page 145. Short of being able to talk like Brian from Family Guy, Sultan was the most exceptional and also the most racist dog of all. Allegedly, Sultan also stopped a burglar from robbing Sandow's room without being violent. Sultan simply blocked the door. And then Sandow's watch which was given to Sandow by a French count. When you read this book, you find out that Sandow has friends in very high places. Well, this watch was robbed because Sandow didn't have Sultan one night. This chapter just peters out after that, with no resolution to the story. No moral. There were only lies about his dog and his riches, his strength and his friends in high places, 
all as some kind of exercise in self-aggrandizement. This unintentionally postmodern story is then followed by a kind of non sequitur about how he offers medals to his pupils if they attain certain levels of strength following his system. Even allowing for the times, the vein of racism is disturbing. In chapter 7, Sandow describes a negative encounter he had with a young African-American boy during his trip to New York. This young boy's occupation was to be a bellboy, meaning it was his job to escort Sandow to his room and explain the hotel's facilities. Sandow repeatedly makes racist remarks in this chapter, saying that the bellboy's impudence was too much for white flesh and blood to bear, leading Sandow to hold the boy by his jacket and trousers over the stairwell and threaten to drop him. Sandow reminded the boy that a drop through 16 floors would not be good even for Nick boys who smoked cigarettes in private rooms and affected to be indignant at the suggestion that they should clean a visitor's boots. Now, venturing a deeper analysis of this passage may be a bit outside of the scope of this video, but if you're interested, I recommend that you read Faye Brower's publication about Sandow's sexuality, the link to which will be in the description of this video. She claimed that there's evidence suggesting that Sandow was queer, and further, that a large dimension of his whole bodybuilding lifestyle was a way to exercise his queer identity without public condemnation. In keeping with that, though this may sound like a reach, perhaps we could read this section as a kind of erotic wish fulfillment on Sandow's part. He's got this young, sassy, exotic boy in his room, whom he teaches a lesson by means of physical overpowerment. I'll proceed. I think it's about time to discuss the training and nutrition advice in Sandow's book. After all, the book is called Strength and How to Obtain It, and the How to Obtain It bit is what I was most curious to find out when I sought out this book. I have one main criticism of this section on how to obtain strength and muscular development. It's that there's simply not enough within it that specifically pertains to training and nutrition. Only about, oh, 20 pages worth. That's right, despite what this section that occupies 100 pages of the book purports to be about, most of it is filled with irrelevant fluff, like client testimonials and advertisements for weight training products. I don't understand the purpose of the client testimonials, since if the reader has already bought the book, then presumably he or she already has some confidence in Sandow's methods. So I don't think Sandow should feel the need to prove anything to the reader with almost 50 pages of client testimonials. That just comes across as a bit insecure on Sandow's part, and uh, it also frustrates the reader, who's more just being told that Sandow's methods work rather than how Sandow's methods work. I will say, however, that there is a silver lining in the abundance of client testimonials, in that it is honestly very wholesome to see that there are all of these young men who were able to see nice results by taking uplifting. As another funny example of fluff in this section, Sandow also spends a relatively great amount of time talking about the benefits of taking cold baths as if this is somehow more important in a book that professes to be about how to get strong than lifting weights and eating food. However, I think with this fluff specifically, we can let it slide and be charitable to Sandow, because he just wasn't fortunate enough to have access to the contemporary scientific literature that shows that cold baths are ineffectual or even counterproductive to recovery and strength development. Fortunately for the reader, what little training advice and nutrition advice there is, is honestly quite good. I'll start with some positive words about Sandow's training advice. On pages 24, 26, and 34, you can see the rudiments of what we today call, in a sports science context, progressive overload and periodization. Sandow outlines what looks like a kind of double progression scheme in the weight room, where once you reach a certain rep target on an exercise, 
you increase the load by a small amount, drop the reps back down, and then repeat the progression with the now heavier weight. This is an impressively systematic approach to lifting, especially given the times. Not even many gym goers today are this methodical about their training, and I think if they were, then they could expect to see better results. Sando is also positive about everyone getting into weight training, whether you're young or old, male or female, weak or strong. Granted, maybe he wouldn't have extended that inclusiveness to black people based on his racism, which I highlighted earlier, but he's certainly more inclusive than you might have expected. There are two readings of this inclusiveness that may not be mutually exclusive. The first is that he was just a real iron enthusiast and wanted to spread the lifting bug so that other people could share in his joy. To be honest, I'm a bit like this. I think lifting dramatically improves your quality of life on the net, and I think it's great that more people are getting into it. And the second reading, perhaps the more pessimistic reading, is that maybe he just wanted to get as many people to buy his products as possible, since the more demographics you can get into lifting, the bigger your potential clientele and the more money you'll make, because that bigger clientele will buy your product. As an aside, I think this is likely to be the same reason why many big corporate enterprises these days wax sanctimonious with their preachings about tolerance and reaching equality of all people in their advertising. I think it's mostly just a sales tactic and doesn't really speak to their ethics. Sando recommends being cautious when lifting weights and progressing gradually, which is good advice. But beyond that, and the other points I touched on, it's unfortunately pretty tough to review Sandow's training advice in depth because there's really just not that much of it. I mean, Sandow even admits as much himself in Chapter 8, a single-page chapter titled Heavy Weightlifting, where he explains that he can only teach people in depth about heavy lifting in person, which is slightly disappointing. Maybe he just wanted to avoid liability if someone got hurt following advice he'd written in a book, and maybe this is why he doesn't devote more time to explain how to train. As a closing and positive thought about Sandow's training advice, he does provide training programs in Chapter 3, and I like that he's given some more theoretical advice in terms of how to progress over time, and also some more practical advice in terms of what specifically to do when hoisting the weight. Unfortunately, much of Chapter 3 refers to an instructional pamphlet that the book originally came with about how to perform certain exercises. It would have been very nice to review this pamphlet, but unfortunately it's hard to get your hands on today, with the only copy I found going for almost 800 US dollars on Abe Books. Let's talk Sandow's nutrition advice now. At first I wanted to give a scathing critique of Sandow's nutrition advice. That's because, prima facie, it really is strikingly bad. Sandow only devotes one page in the whole book explicitly to nutrition. In another one-page chapter titled Nutritive Qualities of Foods. And, as you'll see, the briefness here isn't a consequence of the information being so useful and dense that Sandow simply didn't need to write anymore. What this page contains is a table that Sandow declares to be a clear illustration of the nutritive materials in different foods. Now, as much as I love this table as a picture of what people ate, and a historical record of the food science that was available at Sandow's time, this table isn't helpful in the least to bodybuilders. In the right-hand column, I suppose I should gesture with my left hand since it's mirrored. Anyway, um, yeah, in the right-hand column, <laughs> um, you're given the protein to calorie ratio of different food items, which is so far so good. However, Sando isn't telling you how much protein and how many calories you get from 100 grams of oatmeal. Instead, he's telling us how much protein and how many calories we get from 5 
cent of oatmeal. That's right, the, the currency. Indeed, every food item is quantified not by weight, but by what nutrition you can get for how much you pay in cents. I mean, this says nothing about how many grams of each food item I have to eat to obtain my desired protein and calorie targets. And Sandow also says nothing about how many grams of protein I should seek to obtain, or what kinds of food I should preference as an aspiring bodybuilder. Sandow just leaves you with this table, gives you no means of how you should interpret or use it, and then moves on. I mean, even just a sample day of eating would have been infinitely more helpful than this. But I think we can soften our criticism of Sandow's nutrition advice just a little bit because of a small passage on page 90, which isn't even in the How to Obtain Muscle and Strength section of the book. Where Sandow claims to have achieved his physique and strength without following a special diet, he writes, It may be useful to remark that no particular form of diet was adopted. I ate and drank in the ordinary way. It may be said at once that I have no belief in special diet. There is no better guide to good living than moderation. Be moderate in all things, and you need fear no interruption in gaining strength by my system of training. Well, given the fact that Sandow lied so often about pretty much everything else, you might be inclined to treat this claim with scepticism. You might think he's downplaying his level of effort on the dietary front to give himself some kind of air of giftedness, as if to say that he's so talented that he doesn't have to put any effort in on the dietary front. And while there might be an element of truth to that reading, this is one case where I actually believe Sandow. I mean, it's long been professed by charlatans that the best way to get in shape is to follow some kind of special diet, be it ultra-high protein, keto, carnivore. But those claims are largely just based on weak science and lies pushed by unethical people in the supplement industry who just want to line their pockets and don't actually care about you. In fact, the most recent meta-analytic data on optimal protein intake for muscle growth suggests a measly 1.6 grams of protein per kilo body weight daily, which is relatively modest compared to many of the recommendations you see in the fitness industry. But alas, I have no doubt that had Sandow known he could have made a lot of money selling fart powders, he would have changed his tune on the matter of diet in a heartbeat. If I may make a useful remark of my own, it's that what Sandow would have called a normal diet back then is wildly different to what we today in the developed world call a normal diet. A normal diet back in Sandow's day would have consisted of grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, say some modest portions of dairy, eggs, and lean meats. And if lucky, you might be able to get your hands on some shortbread biscuits. However, a normal diet today is very different in that it consists of readily available, highly palatable, low micronutrient density, high calorie density, ultra-processed foods and beverages like soft drinks, beers, burgers, cakes, pizzas, fried chicken, potato crisps, chocolates, and you name it. So don't feel licensed by Sandow to eat a normal diet by today's standards, based on a passage that was written over a full century ago. What we can take away from these few nuggets of sanity in Sandow's book is that Sandow was actually full of wisdom, and he could have said much more of value in this book if he wanted to. But instead, he opted for fluff and this baffling welter of autobiographical lies. Let's talk about the lies. A question I'd like to pose is this. Why did Sandow feel the need to concoct grandeur? Or put differently, why did Sandow feel that the truth was inadequate? I mean, this is a guy who, as I see it, basically had it made. I mean, he really did have an extraordinary life. 
People did marvel at his physique. Eminent people came to his performances. He drew crowds. He probably did lift some impressive weights. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote the foreword to another one of Sandow's books. Can't think of it off the top of my head, but I'll probably put it on screen. I mean, I don't think Sandow had to embellish anything. He could have just told the truth, and that would have made his book much more empowering for the Victorian reader, and an enduring, illuminating historical record for us. But because we can't separate fact from fiction, pretty much every autobiographical claim he makes is discredited. And to obtain any value from the book, you have to engage in this tedious labour of scrutinising his every claim. And this is a shame, because the great things that Sandow probably did do are all undermined. I can only speculate as to why Sandow felt the need to lie. But my hypothesis is basically just that he was a very ambitious fellow. And an ambitious fellow who might have felt that the truth could only get him so far. He knew he was good, but he couldn't just be good. He had to be extraordinary, superhuman. He needed a brand name, some mystique. And maybe he felt that honest, natural bodybuilding alone couldn't get him there. So, funnily enough, I think the very psychological traits that led Sandow to bodybuilding in the first place, namely ambition, the hunger for more, were the same ones that led him to lie. And I don't think it would be a stretch to say that bodybuilding can appeal to ambitious and narcissistic people because it offers a way to obtain more power. With muscle mass comes prestige, influence, social standing, etc. In a word, power. But eventually, natural bodybuilders effectively stop gaining muscle, at least at noticeable rates. This is because muscle and strength gains are asymptotic when you're natural, meaning they exponentially diminish. You make a lot of gains at first, but then that rate of gain slows dramatically until it becomes relatively negligible. In other words, in natural bodybuilding, you find that you have to work exponentially harder and smarter to see exponentially fewer results over time. No doubt Sandow found himself in this predicament, all naturals do, and maybe it annoyed him because he could no longer obtain increasingly more power from bodybuilding with more and more muscle mass. Today, ambitious narcissists face this predicament by injecting exogenous hormones and then attributing their extraordinary results, not to pharmaceutical enhancement, but to hard work or special over-the-counter supplements or training ebooks or meal plans that they're selling. But Sandow, being a natural bodybuilder, he had to get creative. So, instead of enhancing his physique by injecting exogenous hormones, he enhanced the truth by injecting it with confabulation. He realised he actually didn't need to develop 17-inch forearms if he could just say that he has them. He didn't need to deadlift 800 pounds with one finger if he just said that he could. I think it's harder to dispel bullshit when it's mixed with truth, and I think that's what makes Sandow's kind of lying especially insidious. See, if there's no truth mixed in with lies, then there's nothing to disentangle. But just imagine being a sceptical 19th century reader. You think, 800 pounds, that's a lot of weight. I mean, 17 inch forearms, that's mighty thick. Lions, they're pretty deadly. Uh, Well, Mr. Sandow looks mighty strong, but I'm not so sure about these claims he's making. But who are you to disagree with the great Eugen Sandow? He's got the physique. Like, that's undeniable. Just look at his pictures. The proof. The truth. It's there. You don't have the physique. And, well, you might think... You don't get a physique like Sandow's without being pretty strong, so 
you're sort of forced to resign and accept his claims, since you don't have a leg to stand on. And that to me is what's most sickening. Sandow lied because he knew that he could, that nobody could challenge him. I guess he thought he could get away with it. He thought he had enough truth on his side that his lies would be believable, or at least unassailable. I suppose one potential counter-argument to what I'm suggesting is that Sandow's lies belong to a particular literary style of Victorian England that's full of hyperbole, where the reader knows that the author's claims should be taken with a grain of salt. Charitably interpreted, Sandow's stories could be seen as the most honest way to lie, as if that's not an oxymoron. But even if that's true, I don't think what Sandow did is forgivable. I think what's more likely is that he would have delighted in exploiting the latitude of the genre for his own personal gain. He can hide his lies behind the genre, and that way dodge potential criticism, just like how edgy comedians hide their racism behind layers of irony. And no, I won't name names because they're not worth my breath. When I first read Sandow's disappointing book, Strength and How to Obtain It, a question irked me. Why did bodybuilding have to be predicated on bullshit? And I think I finally have an answer. It's because bodybuilding easily defaults to a compulsion for more, more, more. But like I said, bodybuilding alone can only get you so far. Eventually, especially if you're natural, you effectively reach a plateau. The gains run out, and you're met with a question. Do you reconcile yourself to your plateau and enjoy maintaining a stable muscularity, or do you continue with smoke and mirrors? Well, if you're about more, 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 to the extent that you go with the latter option, as Sandow clearly was, then you can see how bodybuilding and bullshitting might be one continuous project. And thus, we have the birth of the modern fitness industry.